talk about all of this, right? Common hazardous dust. So let's talk about this a little bit more because we're going to get in tonight to illnesses, right? So, um, so, so here you go. Y'all give me one second. Brandon's trying to get in. So let me, let me send them the link real quick. Or is it is it that when I email y'all the link isn't that obvious y'all is that is that what the issue is or it says join now all you gotta do is click on it. yeah Matt can you text it to Brandon real quick would you mind texting him the link yeah I'm gonna email it here okay thank you man is that the attendee uh, go to online training dot com yeah I think maybe y'all aren't noticing that it's the the link you know so let me see give me one second y'all. Give me one second. Okay, so so let's talk about illnesses, right? So let's start with uh, asbestos. Asbestos is going to probably be one of two things, y'all. It's going to be either asbestosis or misethylenomia. Okay. So and we all agree what what part what what uh, asbestos? What part of the body? What organ does it attack, or what part of the body? lungs exactly right it, it attacks the lungs right just like silica right okay so so it's going to be either the the two chronic illnesses from it and we'll talk about chronic versus acute is uh asbestosis or misethylonomia these are the three most common um these are the three most there's the six in bold right here leon uh leroy the the six yeah. uh bolded are the, the the six different types of asbestos the three that you see yes. have a description here are the most common. Okay. Common, exactly. Mm -hmm. Crystal tile, think about white or crystal. Amosite, think about the, the stone amosite, right? More like a brown or a dark red. And then uh, mm -hmm. crocodilite, think about crocodiles and think about like blue water. Okay. All right. It's mostly found in different construction materials. Um, they're also often tend to be uh, friable, which means they're airborne. And the more airborne or they are, the greater risk they are that they pose a hazard for us. Um, and it's a greater hazard that they pose to us, uh, the more that it is friable or airborne, okay, or crushable. So friable, just think crushable and airborne is what the definition of friable is, the short definition. Uh, let's see. Now, like I said, Leon, that, that four-hour webinar is going to run you through all this math and everything, okay? All right, so now let me go to let, – let's go to the OSHA's website. And let me go back a step. Okay, let's talk about right here. Let's talk about Hazwopper. When we talk about Hazwopper, y'all, we're going to talk about hazardous waste operations. Okay, cleanup, right, to spills or responses. We're also going to talk about the level suits again, Matt and Shelly. And we're going to talk about the ICS of the incident command model as well, okay? This, Shelly, is going to lead us into the training and a few other requirements as well, okay? So, okay. so first of all, you know, right here, right? You know, if we have to clean up a spill or a release is what we're talking about. An unexpected spill or release, what's going to happen is that employees are going to have to be uh, – they're going to have to be hazwapper trained to their skill level if they're required to do any cleanup or any remediation. Okay, so where the law comes from is right here. This law comes from RICRA. Okay, it's the it's the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. It's part of the EPA, y'all. So RICRA is the EPA. Hazwapper is the DOT. Excuse me. RICRA is the EPA. Hazwapper is OSHA. Hazmat is the DOT. It's all built on the same standard. Okay. So what happens is a lot of it, y'all, y'all, are y'all familiar with when they talk about super fun sites? You know, talking about like massive cleanup sites. Mm, y'all remember what? Y'all remember Three Mile Island? With yeah. The waste in New York. That was a super fun site. Okay. We have um, a lot of super fun sites down in the lower coast of Louisiana. And a lot of the protected waters from from illegal dumping that happened in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 70s, and even the 80s. Okay, and what happened was these big these companies 
had to pay a lot, of, especially Chevron. They paid a lot of money to get some of these areas cleaned up in order to get them remediated from, from illegal dumping. Okay. So, so remember this, y'all. It's RICRA, right? R-C-R-A. And mm -hmm. the key to RICRA is cradle to grave. That means whoever births a chemical, right, or a drum or container, they own that container till the day it dies and gets buried or destroyed. Okay? So what happens is, think about a 55-gallon drum, right? If I got a 55-gallon drum of, Sh of Chevron or, uh, let's say, what it was it, Texaco before that, right? Of Texaco crude oil, man. And all of a sudden, now, that, that drum is found in the middle of, let's say, I-10, right? In the rainstorm and there's hydrocarbons on the ground. That drum could have been made from 20, 30 years ago, y'all. That drum is going to get charged, and that cleanup is going to get charged to Chevron if it's Chevron's drum, unless Chevron buy a lot number and 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 serial number for that barrel can prove who it went to. Okay, once they prove who they sold it to, and then it follows the lineage until somebody can't prove it anymore, and then they own the cleanup for that drum, the removal and the cleanup remediation. Okay, so it's called cradle to grave. Whatever chemical company births it or refinery births it, they own it until somebody else adopted it or bought it. Okay? And like I said, on the EPA side, it's called RICRA, R-C-R-A. For Hazwapper, for OSHA, it's called Hazwapper. And then for the DOT for transportation, train, vehicle, vessel, whatever the case is, it's going to be Hazmat. Okay? And then um, and what are we talking about? Right, it's it's operations involving hazardous waste that are conducted at treatment, storage, disposal facilities is what we basically are talking about. That's regulated by the EPA, okay, by the Environmental Protection Agency. So emergency responses for those incidental or accidental releases, okay, or even intentional releases is what we're looking at to clean up. OSHA adopted it, and why did OSHA adopt it? Because the EPA protects the public. And the DOT protects the, the roadways, airways, railways, all the uh, pipeline, all the, all the five different modes of transportation, okay? So OSHA adopted it to protect us in the workplace, but we also have EPA and RICRA protection as the public as well, okay? So hazardous substances right here, cleanup operations, um, what happens is that there's certain paragraphs we're going to comply with and we're going to talk about them, okay? So... What's going to happen is, is if we have a spill, we're going to wind up having to, to train our employees. So let me go to training first, and then we'll come back up, okay? Excuse me. So let's go through a uh, – let's look at a few definitions, all right, and, we, and, then, and then we're moving into the training. So qualified person, right? Uh, a person with specific training, knowledge, experience in the area in which the person has a responsibility or an authority to control. So if I have a qualified person who's running the cleanup operation, what did it have to be? They have to have knowledge, right, training, and experience in order to do that particular cleanup or environment, okay? So um, like I said, we have to have certain requirements also for Hazwapper, all right? We have to have certain requirements for Hazwapper. This is what we're going to have to have. First and foremost, we have to have a written health and safety plan, Okay. That written health and safety plan is going to have have an organizational structure. Do y'all remember the other day we talked about um, ICS model, incident command, Leroy? Let me pull it up. Yeah, I remember, I think, Leroy, didn't you pull your org chart the other day like this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what we're talking about, okay? So I'm talking about your ICS model or your incident command. And if you notice right here, y'all, like we talked about, look at safety. Safety, the public information officer, liaison, and also human resources. They're all off to the side. You see there's no line here, okay? So what, so all of this is independent of all of these operations down here, okay? But you have an incident commander. The person that's the incident commander is the highest ranking official at the time of the release of the spill, okay? When we realize that we have a problem and that we're going into an emergency situation. As more seasoned or higher ranking officials come on site for that organization, for that company, or for that group of companies, responsibilities will begin to shift 
to whomever is the most responsible or and and or is the most seasoned uh, for an emergency response. Okay. So like I said, we got operations, we got planning, we got logistics, and we got finance, right? Because we need somebody to fix the money and pay for everything. And these four are under the direction of the incident commander, and each one of them has different responsibilities. However, like I said, we are here and we are independent, so we're not above these, and we're not below them. We're completely independent of them. And like I said, it's just because we're just the only line of command that safety should have is directly to senior management. Okay. Uh, hey, Doug. Yes. I, I got the chart you gave me, the incident organization organization chart, the IS two hundred seven. It's uh -huh. not. It's not. It's not the same chart. <laughs> okay. Well, they have different charts. It's a different looking chart. Um, do me a favor. Te text me a picture of the one you have, real quick. Okay. And I'm gonna put it up here. Okay. So it may be a different chart. So this is the thing. It doesn't have to be the exact same chart, Lee, uh, Leroy, but it's going to have pretty much the same um, offset, okay, for public information, for, uh, for liaison, and for uh, safety. It's going to end up having its own offset. So as soon as you text it to me, I'll, I'll pull it up, and I'll, I'm going to airplay it and put it up here on my, on my computer, okay? All right. So let me go back to the standard while you're pulling that up for me. Should be on its way. Okay. I don't know if that's too dark. Let me try to get a higher picture. Um, as soon as it comes through, I'll open it up. Okay. All right. So we have to have a. Okay. I got it. Hang on a second. No, we're good. Hang on. That's a little better one, I guess. No, that's okay, man. We're good. This will work. This will work perfect. Hang on. All right, all right, so here you go, right? All right, so you see where your incident commander is here, Leroy? Yes. And you see here where safety, liaison, and public information officer is? And you see mm -hmm. how nothing touches here? It's still the same offset. Okay? Okay. It's still the same offset, right? You have operations, one leg for operations, planning, logistics, and finance. So, so incident command branches down to operations planning logistics and finance right those are the four limbs okay and then you have a separate limb totally a separate and apart which is the safe the liaison officer safety officer and public information officer now let me go back to the web to to the internet and if you look at it it might not look the same but it's the same effect do you see what i'm saying so we have these four branches here that are one each each branch or each limb and then here if you look at it the same thing they don't answer to anyone except for upper man, to insert commander. Okay, so it's a different it's a different layout, but it's the exact same principle. So see here, would you agree with this that safety has no authority over any of these groups? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you look look right here. Safety has yeah. no authority over these groups, right? It's in the, it into itself. It answers only to the incident commander. So does public information. So does liaison. Okay. So now let me go back to the picture that you sent me again. And here you go. It's the same thing. See, safety comes out. It only answers to the incident commander. Okay. So they look different, but they're the same structure. Okay. Is that clear, or do I need to clear it up a little bit more? No, it is. I was just wondering. I mean, you explain it. That's fine. Yeah, don't worry about layout. They're both they they're both ICS two hundred seven. It follows the same flow chart. Okay, it just cosmetically it looks a little different. Okay. All right. So now let me go back to the website. 
All right, so we talked about ICS model. Um, let's get rid of the calculator. Okay, so we have to have the org chart. Matt, we have to have a comprehensive work plan, right? Exactly what we're talking about on the, most of those questions, right? That, uh, that it comes right back to, uh, that it comes right back to comprehensive work plan, okay? Also, site-specific safety and health plan. So look, we got org chart, comprehensive work plan, right? The planning stage, right? Now we have our site specific. Now we have our health and safety training programs, our medical surveillance program, our operating procedures, okay? And then necessary interface between the general, between the general program and site specific activities. So now what are we talking about? We're talking about site specific planning, okay? Okay, so let me now let me come back. So and let me let me actually go to the incident commander. Okay, so procedures for, for handling emergency responses, right? The senior emergency response official responding to an emergency is going to become the individual in charge of the site. They're called uh, incident commander. So Leroy. I got, let's say it's a night shift, right? Let's say mm -hmm. we're working on a skeleton crew at a chemical processing facility, right? Normally during the day, we may have a couple hundred people. Maybe we've got a skeleton crew of as little as 30 people, right? If we've got, okay. if, the, if, the, if the group supervisor is the highest ranking position at that time during that release, that is the person that should have been trained already to be the incident commander, to take over because the work plan and the work processes told us that that is the person that is the highest authority on that shift, okay? So so let's say it happens at 2, 3 in the morning, right? And if it's a refinery or a chemical processing plant, all right? And um, so it is, it's going to be, the that person's going to be incident commander. As soon as that person's supervisor shows up or somebody of a higher ranking authority out of one of those other groups, and let me go back. I should have left the org chart up there. Let's see. Okay, well, let's use yours since I got it right here, Leroy. All right. Somebody else shows up that's a higher authority than than that person. Let's say if that person is in the operations section and they're here, right? All of a sudden, somebody shows up either here or even in their own group that's got a higher authority. They'll become the incident commander all the way up until you get to the GM or the CEO of the organization. Okay. So it will continue scaling up until, until they get to the highest rank. <laughs> and or the highest trained person who is going to be the ultimate um, incident commander probably during working hours or early morning hours after an incident's happened, okay? <clears throat> so so all emergency responders, right, and their, and their communications shall be coordinated and controlled through the individual in charge. So it goes back to no, remember Lee, uh, Leroy here, we talked about communication and coordination. That's exactly what we're talking about here. What we're trying to do here is make sure that there's not a gap in communication and that all groups coordinate and that they know what the hierarchy of command is. Okay. All right. So that's that's incident command, right? So right here, the senior official at an emergency response is the most senior official on the site who has a responsibility for controlling the operations of that site. That's exactly what I was talking about right now. Initially, it's a senior officer. Right on the first, on the first due piece of the of the responding emergency apparatus to arrive on the incident. Okay, as more this is what I was talking about right here, Leroy. As more senior officers arrive, what happens is that position can be passed up the line until it gets up to the top. Okay, so it's always highest ranking and trained person to respond to the incident, and then. Uh, the individual in charge of the ICS, you know, to the extent possible, right? Uh, all hazardous conditions present, substances have to be addressed as appropriate site analysis. We have to use engineer controls in order to, uh, you know, maximum exposure limits, uh, hazardous substances handling for procedures, and then use any type of new technology that we may have. What kind of technology? <clears throat> might be absorbent boom. It might be drain covers that are made out of... Uh, Let's say like Chemtech or Tyvek material, suit material, okay? 
might be airbags or or some type of uh, or um, or plastic covers that we put over site drainage because the whole key is this right and I think most of us know this that if we release a chemical a chemical or some some type of hazardous chemical the number one responsibility is to make sure it doesn't hit the water okay we don't want it in the land but at least that land absorbs and we can remediate land but if it hits drainage like site drainage right collection basins swallows let's say if it hits any of tributaries that may run into a creek right a river um a pond a lake that's where we're most at concern because remember the the density of most chemicals y'all is less than one so that means that it's going to float most chemicals float on top of the water and they often expand 17 times 1700 times over water okay Y'all ever notice that like when you see somebody filling up a boat and they drop a few drops of gasoline or diesel, you ever see how much it spreads over the, uh, over the water? Mm-hmm. It's because most of that spreads 1,700 times over water. Up to 1,700 times. Okay? So also, based on hazardous substances or conditions, right, the individual in charge is going to implement appropriate emergency operations. Here's the thing, y'all. If we don't have, you know, we have to have people that are trained to do their job. If we don't have, um, if we don't have people that are fire extinguisher trained, we can't use a fire extinguisher. If we don't have employees that are trained on hazardous material cleanup, right, or on their Tyvek suits, or let's say level A, B, or C PPE, Leroy, if they haven't been trained, we can't put them in it. We just got to wait until somebody qualified to do the cleanup and appropriately donned, right? Donning and doffing our PPE to do, that's been trained, that is authorized to do the work and that has adequate protection can do the work. If not, we can't, we can't, unfortunately, we can't stop those hazardous chemicals. Okay. So employee number one. So yeah, it's, it's, it's extremely important to protect the environment. And like I said, protect any type of site drainage and uh, water going into any type of tributaries. But it's even more important to protect the employees that we have on staff. <laughs> so now those employees that are engaged in emergency response and uh, exposure to hazardous substances uh, that may present any type of hazard like an inhalation hazard, right? They have to wear pressure. They, they're going to have to probably wear some type of SCBA while engaged in the emergency response. So, Leroy, we talked the other night about uh, levels A through D, PPE for for Hazwapper, I'm about to talk about it again, okay? And then in addition to that, we have to wear Hazwapper until we can determine that, uh, that that through air monitoring that we can start decreasing the level of PPE. Now look, y'all, I'm going to tell you, we got a benzene, we got a, you know, something released like hexene, toline, xylene, he, uh, benzene. Yeah, we're going to be in some type of uh, respiratory apparatus and probably a, um, a self-contained. But this is why it's so important to have those safety data sheets too, because and know what the chemical is. Because if, if we have a release of gasoline or diesel, we're not going to have to get in level uh, C or D uh, PPE, I mean A or B PPE. Why? Because we already know the, we already know. So let's say we already know the effects. So let, let me give you an example, y'all. Let's say we use a um, 25,000 barrel tank, right? We got 10,000 barrels into it and we have a leak of gasoline. We already know that that gasoline is probably not going to be toxic to us. So we probably won't be more like than the level C or a level B PPE, but I don't see us going to a level A. Okay. But yet if it's toluene, xylene, hexene, acetone, or it's a chemical like that, that could be highly hazardous, especially at larger quantities than consumable quantities that we use. And then um, that's when we we may have to be in some type of SCB, SCBA equipment, okay? Like I said, right, the, the, the individual in charge, they're gonna limit the number of emergency response personnel uh, to an emergency for the site, okay? And the potential for our exposure, why? Administrative control, we're controlling how many employees we put exposed to that environment. Not only that, 
you we, it, a lot of it's going to have to be determined by the size and the nature of the release. Okay. Also, we don't we're not using a we're not seeing this like a confined space yet, y'all. We're actually it's a buddy system. Okay. So we're actually using a buddy system as opposed as opposed to a permit required confined space right now. Okay. Now, now, Matt, the more hazardous the chemical that's been released, obviously the greater safety measures we're going to take in place. That's why it's so important to know what a chemical inventory is. It's so important to know and be able to identify quickly on what got released okay, and, have access, and have access to those safety data sheets for what's been released as well. Now, the, the individual in charge of the ICS has a designate a safety official who's knowledgeable in the operations are being implemented for the emergency response site with specific responsibilities, right? To identify and evaluate hazards and to provide direction with respect to the safety and operations uh, for the field at hand. So doesn't it kind of sound like a, doesn't it almost sound like a competent person responsibility, at least for the knowledge base and the recommendations we're gonna put out? Yes. You know, but Matt, this is the way I look at it, okay? If you take the definition of a, of a competent person without the authorization to take prompt corrective action, that now we're only recommending prompt corrective action, and then we're going to probably meet this responsibility. Okay? But we have to be trained. What kind of trained? Either has Whopper 24, has Whopper 40, depending on what exposure we're going to have. Okay? Uh, when activities are judged by the safety official uh, to be an IDLH condition, Remember we talked about the other day. Let me go to this, okay? Remember, I, I don't recall if y'all remember this or not. I told you that um, that we agreed that imminent danger is the greatest hazard, right, in the workplace. And um, and let me pull up 1910-146. Got 1,200, let's see. Let me go to definition of... Let me, let me go to the definition of uh, IDLH, y'all. I want to make sure that we're on the same page. Here's the definition of IDLH. It means any condition that would interfere with an individual's ability to escape unaided from a permitted space or that poses a threat to life or that would cause irreversible health or effect, health effects. So... Just because every employee is in the work area doesn't necessarily mean that they're exposed to IDLH hazards, okay? Now, remember this, y'all. IDLH, okay? IDLH is also imminent danger because imminent danger is any significant risk, but not all imminent danger is IDLH, okay? IDLH is strictly atmospheric in a confined space. Um, also, um, after the emergency operations, right, have terminated, the individual in charge of the ICS has to implement automatic decontamination procedures. So what are we talking about? We're talking about setting up, uh, hang on a second, let me see, like hot zones, warm zones, cool zones. So <clears throat> this so is what I'm talking about. It's something like this. Here's our spill, right? The hot zone is anything around the spill. We come, that we have an access point in and out because we don't want to be walking in and out of the hot zone everywhere, okay? So you have a limit to where you can be. Then we have our decontamination corridor, which is also called the warm zone. And then we have the cool zone, which is once we're out of that, that decon area, okay? So let me show you. Uh, I want to show you right here. This is the one I was looking for right here. But Matt, this is what I'm talking about, okay? Let's say this truck, let's say this truck's got, um, I don't know, let's say a hydrofluoric acid, right? And there's a spill. Let's say whether we had to be SCBA or we just had to be Tyvek suits, let's say at a level C, right? It depends. I mean, at a level B. Um, so SCBA would be level C or D or a regular full face respirator would be level a level B, okay? So what happens is this, is that where we have the spill, we're going to quarantine the area, and we're going to quarantine an area that's much larger than where the spill is, y'all, okay? This is this area right here is our hot zone. Our warm zone is between the hot zone until we get to a cool zone, 
which means there should not be any risk of hazardous chemicals. However, we still need to get people from a hot zone all the way to the cool zone. So what do we do? We give them right here an access corridor, right? We give them a hallway or an access corridor. And that's what gets us from the hot zone. We decontaminate. And then by the time we come out of full decontamination, we're now in the in the cool zone. Okay? Y'all good with that? Going once, going twice. Y'all good? Okay, so... Now, um, when deemed necessary, right, uh, for meeting the task at hand, approved self-contained compressed air breathing apparatus has to be used uh, with approved cylinders um, from other approved self-contained uh, compressed air breathing apparatuses that provide uh, cylinders, all right, of the same capacity for breathing rating. So remember this. So basically, y'all know how these, these uh, SCBAs are, right? Normally, we rate them at 30-minute packs. Y'all, it can last 30 minutes, it can last longer, it can last less. Depends on the person's breathing, it depends on the surcharge or the trauma that the body's taking at the time, okay? So if we have to replace uh, SCBAs, we have to replace them with fully charged SCBAs, okay? And then skilled support personnel, right? Personnel not, necessary, not necessarily an employee, employer's own employees who are skilled in the operation of certain equipment like uh, mechanized earth moving equipment. So think about like excavators, dozers, backhoes, trackers, right? Or digging equipment or crane or a hoist and, um, and, and who are needed temporarily to perform the immediate uh, services. Uh, they cannot reason, uh, they can't reasonably be performed, let's say by the employer or the employer's employees. And then what will happen is uh, they're not required to meet the training required in this paragraph. So basically if we pull in employees last minute right unexpected and not knowing they may not be held to the same standard this is why matt because perhaps they they were trained to their level let's say a 24 hour you know maybe it was in-house unofficial 24 hour or 40 hour what happens is those employees never had an anticipation to be trained but the thing is we got to give them some training so what are we going to do we're going to do some type of initial training or some type of instruction, show them how to wear their PPE, because why the government doesn't want those hydrocarbons, they don't want those hazards and, and released into the environment. Okay, so that's why that's why they're um, they're going to make sure that first of all they prefer that we that it's something that we're uh, insured for, let's say, right, and that we have protection and it's something that employees do on a regular basis. However, there are some concessions because it may be a situation where it's not routinely done. Okay, so we're going to give them initial breathing, breathing, right? You know, including instructions on how to wear the appropriate PPE, what chemical hazards might be involved, and the duties that are going to be performed by each employee. Okay, letting them know what their scope of responsibility is. Okay, so specialist employees, y'all right here, 65Q5. Special employees uh, are employees who, who in the course of their regular job duties they work with or they're trained in the hazards of specific substances. So now what I'm talking about, now I'm talking about somebody, let's say it's lab tech, right? Or let's say a, a chemical processor or an operator is a perfect example of this, y'all. Okay. Why? Because that's their technical work. And it's the belief is that they would, they would be involved in the, in the hazardous substance cleanup. Okay. Or to be able to mitigate any losses or damages. Okay. And then here we go. Here's the training. So I think this is where we started earlier, right? Is uh, training has to be based on the duties and functions that are going to be performed by each responder uh, for the emergency response team or the emergency response organization. The skill and the knowledge levels that are required uh, for all new responders. Those hired as an effective date of the standard, they have uh, it's got to be conveyed right to them through training before they're permitted to take care of. Uh, take care of any actual emergency operations or an incident. That's what I was talking about. We have to be properly trained to do job at hand. Okay. Hey Doug, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. I just want to make sure I'm muting it and, and where it says mute and unmute. All right. I'm going to make sure I'm muted. Okay. Good deal, Brandon. So Brandon, we're recorded. So we're going to post this one too. We're talking about HazWapper requirements right now and the incident command model. All right. 
Ten four. Thank you. And then employees that, that participate, right, are expected to participate in emergency response. They have to be given training in accordance with the following paragraphs. So this is what I was talking about right here, y'all. So first responder awareness level, right? So first responders at awareness level, they're going to be individuals that are likely to be uh, witnesses or they might discover the release, right? So what are we talking about? Normal field operation technicians, right? And um, and then they have to be trained to initiate the emergency response, okay, in the sequence on how they're going to notify supervision or the authorities of the release. Y'all, this is an EPA requirement and it is a Coast Guard requirement if there's navigable water that proper authorities have to be notified, okay? It's not like, oh, Matt, we're waiting for senior management to come in. Nope. Employer, it's the employer's responsibility. It, it's not the supervisor, right? It's the employer's responsibility to notify uh, to notify the EPA and to notify the Coast Guard that they had a material lease. They may have to notify OSHA as well, but at a minimum, the EPA and the DOT, because that's who's got jurisdiction over hazardous chemical materials, okay? Um, uh, they take no further action beyond notifying the authorities of the release. Okay, first responders at awareness level have to have sufficient training, uh, or have an or have sufficient experience, and be able to demonstrate the certain competencies. Right, competencies. These are the competencies they're gonna have to address, and we're gonna talk about this because this is getting us into our twenty-four and our forty-hour, y'all. So this is a first responder at awareness level. Okay, it's an understanding of the hazard substances, right, and the risk is associated. So what is this? It's almost like the definition of a confined space, Shelly. Knowing the hazards and what can go wrong, right? That's the first thing we need to know at an awareness level training. Okay? Also, an, an understanding of the potential outcomes that might be associated with an emergency that created uh, the, the hazard substances that are present. Okay? So basically, are the chemicals, is the chemical that's released, is it going to cause, a, uh, let's say, an injury to somebody, right? Is it going to cause an asphyxiation hazard? Is it going to cause a poisoning hazard? So that's what we're talking about. Uh, they also have to have the ability to recognize the, president, the presence of the hazardous substance in an emergency. They have to have the ability um, to identify the hazardous substance and an understanding of the role of the first responder awareness um, through their employer's emergency response plan. What is their responsibility within this uh, event, okay, in this response? They also have to have the ability, they also have to realize the need for additional resources, and they have to make appropriate notifications to the to the communication center, could be safety department, uh, security department, or whatever other uh, personnel that they may be using as their communication personnel, okay? So that, so let me go back up here, y'all, because I want to clarify. This, everything we're talking about right now was right here. First responder awareness level, okay? Now, you're going to see that it's going to be a little bit redundant, so I'm going to pick up the speed a little bit. So first responder now, so so let me go back up one more time. Sorry, give me one second. Right here, first responder awareness level, right? Now we're going to first responder operations level, okay? So the first responders in the operation, at the, at the operations level, okay, that respond to the to the release of potential release. Um, now, what, what's, their, what's, the re, what's the responsibility? Protect persons, right? Employees of the public. Protect property. And then protect the environment. That's the requirement of this HASWA, of that RICRA or HASWAPR. Okay? Um, they're going to be trained to respond in a defensive fashion. We're actually, we're actually not trying to stop the release. What they're trying to do is guide them, the chemical or the hydrocarbon, like I said, to stay away from basically to, um, to drainage or tributaries that maybe put it back into, like I said, any type of water waterfront of tributaries, okay? Uh, their function is to clean, to contain the release uh, from a safe distance, keep it from spreading and prevent exposures. And the first responders at the operational level have to receive at least eight hours of training, okay? Or again, look at this, Matt, or again, have sufficient experience, okay? All right, uh, in order to uh, demonstrate competency in the following areas, uh, and um, in addition to any listed uh, awareness level training, okay? Or knowledge. So y'all, let me ask you a question. How many times do you out there and do you hear that, oh, those employees have to be HAZWAP for 24-hour trained or HAZWAP for 40-hour trained, right? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay, but OSHA puts in a caveat to that. Now, Shelly, these employees still have to be trained, 
but it may, but but they'll, it'll go back to the 1926-21 standard, where they have to be trained to recognize, right, and avoid a hazard and report it, and or try to eliminate or mitigate it. Okay, so it's going to always go back to the general duty hazard. The reason is this: now they don't want employees being exposed, but we can't afford for this sucker to get into the water. Okay, like I said, once it gets into the drain, site drainage water, or now it gets into like a waterfront property, now's a significant risk because it's bad enough it's on land, but at least when it's on land, Matt, uh, Brandon, it gets absorbed, okay, and it's controlled, okay, for the time being. Now, so so this first responder operations level, they have to have at least eight hours, they have to have at least eight hours, or they have to have sufficient experience. And I'm gonna show you where this comes into play because I, I deal with this a good bit with clients, okay. Okay, so they have to have knowledge of basic hazards and risk assessments. They have to know how to select and use a proper PPE, right? Whatever level they're going to be using. Um, they have to have an understanding of a basic hazardous materials and their terms. They have to know how to perform basic control containment, uh, confinement operations uh, with capabilities, right, of, of, of resources, okay? They also have to know how to implement a basic decontamination procedure. So what am I talking about? Something like this. I think I, I think Brandon, this right before you got in, right? Employees have to know how to set up a basic decontamination procedure where the hot zone is the hot zone. And then y'all ever seen when they use in um let me show you what I'm talking about. Y'all ever seen them when they're doing something like this, when they're doing decon? You ever seen when they're doing three pools like this? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They're oh, decamming. Yeah. Okay, see this right here, y'all? This right here is that right there is this blue zone right here. Okay, Shelly? Yep. That right there is the blue zone. That here is the red zone. Okay. They're coming through the blue zone, which is also in between the yellow zone, and they're going to try to get to the green zone or the safe zone. So those employees that we see right now are coming out of here deconning right here along the yellow zone but if they're in the safe access corridor and once they're properly deconned we'll get to the to the clean zone okay the same thing goes with three pools a lot of times you'll see these pools or you'll see a lot of times they use um you know those little baby kitty pools like from walmart and stuff right you're starting to see it less and less now because these pools have become so much more affordable and that they're easier to uh, store now okay so what happens is this y'all i come in fully full of oil right I come in fully full of oil. They bring me to the first one. They scrub me down. Okay. They scrub me down, right? They brush my shoes, my boots. I walk out. I come to this one. Now they brush and scrub my boots again and bring me again. And then they bring me to the last one. And when they bring me to the last one, they're rinsing me off. Okay. So it's like very dirty, semi dirty, and then a final rinse. Is that understandable? Yep. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Okay, y'all. All right. So now let me go back to the standard, okay? <clears throat> okay. They have to have an understanding of relevant standard operating procedures and termination procedures. That's exactly what I'm talking about right now. Standard operation procedures is how we're going to clean it up, right? Or, excuse me, how we're going to contain it and how we're going to clean ourselves up, okay? So let me go back because now I'm going to position three. So number one, we said, and they don't, they don't have a requirement to have uh, safety training, is awareness level right here, right? First responder awareness level, there's not an hour requirement on first responder awareness level, okay? Now, when you come to first responder operations level, first responder operations level, now we have we have that eight hours right here that we have to have training, at least eight hours, okay? And then, or right here, sufficient experience, okay? All right, <laughs> now let me get to the third one. Right here, hazardous materials technicians. Uh, hazmat technicians, y'all. They're individuals who respond to the release, right? Not react, respond, because what are we responding to? The training that they've had or potential releases, okay, for the purposes of stopping the release. They assume a more aggressive role than the first responders, you know, and uh, what we do is we we approach the, the point of release in order to plug it, patch it, right, or somehow stop the hazardous material from coming out. Okay. Now, also in addition to that, hazardous material technicians, they have to have at least, now look at it now. Now they have to have at least 24 hours of training, right? Equal to the first responder operations level. 
And in addition, they have to have competency in the first following areas. They have to know how to implement an employer's emergency response plan, right? They also have to know how uh, the classification, identification, and verification of uh, different materials and be able to do field, conduct field surveys. Because now they may have to be placing parts, equipment, materials, or setting up that warm and cool zone as well. Okay. Also, they have to be able to function within an assigned role um, of the incident commander. Like I said, that won't last long because as soon as senior manager gets there, we tend to get bumped. Okay, And also, you have to know how to select and use proper standardized chemical uh, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, PPE, right? And we have to provide hazardous material technicians, okay? They also have to understand the hazards and the risks uh, that are being assessed and uh, know how to assess them and uh, know what techniques to follow. They have to be able to perform advanced <laughs> So what am I talking about now? So now I'm talking about like a soft boom, hard boom. So let me, let me go to it. So now, let's you know, get back almost to the same thing that we had. Hang on a second. Okay, so now what we're going to talk about is things like we, uh, that's not a good picture. We're going to start doing things like, like this, right? We're going to start cataloging. We're going to start separating our work zones, y'all. We'll start separating our work zones. We're going to have decon zones. We're going to have a hot zones. Anything that's been contaminated, Shelly, if we have any barrels, equipment, tools, materials, trucks, anything, we, um, we're going to go ahead and, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not confiscate, but uh, we're going to uh, quarantine that information, that equipment. Okay. We're going to quarantine that equipment, y'all, until we can safely decontaminate it and get it back into the work environment, right? Or let them take it home. So right here, anything that's in a hot zone, we can, we're going to decontaminate it. They're going to come through this uh, access corridor. And then out here, like I said, safety companies are going to, not safety company, excuse me. Um, uh, we basically decontaminate until we get out, okay? Uh, also, uh, understand and implement decontamination procedures like I was talking about. Know when to terminate the procedures, okay? And then have a basic understanding of chemical and toxicological terminology and behavior. Where do we get this, y'all? Right? Best place we can get this right here is for... Um, is from the safety data sheet, y'all. Okay, every chemical, right? If we're processing a chemical in the workplace, okay, we can, um, you know, if we, if, if we, uh, if, if uh, understand basic chemicals and toxicology, what's the best place we get that? SDS, y'all. All right. Okay. Let me, uh, let me go back now. And here's your last one right here. All right, let's see. I'm sorry, we've got two more. Uh, hazardous material specialists. You'll notice how it doesn't change much, right, y'all? The scope of responsibilities. The more responsibilities, the more training. Would y'all agree with that so far? Yes. Okay. So hazardous material. Look, y'all, look, this is Hazwapper. Who's been Hazwapper trained out there? I got the Hazwapper 40. Okay, there you go. So that, that's where I'm going to, Leroy. Anybody else? Okay, Leroy, are you are you are you training them on Hazwapper two or just confined space or what's the deal, man? Um, yeah, I'm not getting into that. I mean, the Hazwapper forty that that did take a while, but no, I, I do confined space, but um, uh, I did it through Click Safety, uh -huh. and uh, they had the eight hour, sixteen hour, I believe, and the forty. Okay. So did the... And your and your forty hour training? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, all right. That, that, that's where I'm going, y'all. Okay, I'm, uh, um. I'm, so let's give me one second. So let me see. Okay. So it's, see general site workers is going to get us all the way there. Okay. So let's see. I'm going to pick up the speed a little bit because we, can we agree with this? Can we agree that so far there's been a good bit of repetition? Yeah. Okay. It's just getting a little bit stronger each time. Right. Okay. So let me pick up the speed a little bit and then, uh, yeah. Give me one second, let's see.
Okay, so a hazmat <laughs> technician, right? Materials technician. Um, has a material technician, right? Individuals that are going to respond to the release, potential release for the purpose of stopping the release. That's what we talked about. All right, we talked about what, what the responsibilities are for them, right? Also, they have to be able to uh, function with an assigned role. They got to know, again, uh, how to select proper PPE. Okay, understand the hazards and the risks. Be able to perform the advanced control containment because now we're trying to contain it, right? Understand and implement decon procedures that we just talked about. I just ran you through. Also, how to terminate procedures. Now, look, I'm going to tell you, terminate procedures doesn't mean it's cleaned up. It means, you know what, it's beyond our scope of uh, understanding, right, or physical ability to clean it up, and we may have to cut bait on it, okay? We may have to evacuate the area, okay? Also, understand basic, chem uh, like I was talking about, basic chemical and toxicological information and behavior, all right? And then uh, hazardous material specialists, right? Hazardous material specialists, what they're going to do? The individuals who are going to respond with and they're going to provide support to uh, hazmat material technicians. Duties are going to parallel the ones of a hazardous materials technician. However, this is going to be the difference right here. Uh, their duties are going to require more directed and more specific knowledge of various substances uh, that they may be called to contain. So let me tell you, a lot of times what you'll have here is you'll have um, people like industrial hygienists, Matt, uh, industrial hygienists, or you may have uh, lab or tech employees. Okay, that are going to be able to uh, do collections, okay, and then our sampling. And then also hazardous materials specialists, they're going to have to have received at least 24 hours as well, okay. And then they have to know how to implement, again, in the local emergency response plan. All this is the same, y'all. All right, understand the classification, uh, verification of unknown and known substances. They're going to have to know that. Can I buddy in a second? I'm sorry? Can I buddy in one second? Because yeah. I just remembered something of, can you also talk about sampling, like grab sampling and things like that too? Yeah. Sometime within this deal, I'm just, I just uh, remembered a few things. So just some yeah. different sampling. Okay. So, <clears throat> so things like this, right? So look, y'all, I'm not going to keep on, I'm going to get us to the 40 hour. Everything was 24. I'm going to get us to the 40 hour. But let me grab the grab sampling real quick. Kelly, here you go, okay? So we're going to have to have – we agree that we have a hazardous chemical and that we've got a release. Do we agree with that so far for Hazwopper, right? Yep. Okay. We also agree that employees can only do their level of work for which they've been trained and to, to the point to where their exposure can be controlled. Do we agree with that? Yes. Yep. Okay, good. Okay, now let's talk about medical surveillance, right? We've got medical surveillance requirements. Brandon, you and I, right? You, Brandon, didn't you work the spill? Yeah, I did. Okay. So medical surveillance. You remember how they were putting badge samples on people? Like uh, for uh, – remember they were doing like badge samples and they were putting – and they are bringing out more meters for the BP oil spill? Yes. All right. Yes, so sir. This is why, man, because they were doing the badge sampling for benzene, okay, for benzene and toline and xylene, okay? And then, um, and then what happens is – the frequency and types of air monitoring, like it could be personnel monitoring, environmental sampling techniques. They may be swabbing. They may be picking up from environments, okay? Also, there's going to be different instrumentation used, right? Also, there's a requirement of calibrating that equipment. Some of these, y'all, sometimes, some of, most of the meters require every six months, okay? Even for confined space, except for MSHA. MSHA requires daily. Now, when we get into frequency and types of monitoring, y'all, and we get into calibration, a lot of times what will happen is the industrial hygienist or the industrial or the environmental team will turn around and say, like for the BP oil spill, Brandon probably remembers this, where we're having to daily, daily calibrate our equipment. Okay. That way we were assuring every day that our meter was reading what the meter said we were reading. Okay. We also have to go back, right? Side control measures. Um, but that's that's what the sampling. Let me see, let me see if they talk where else they talk about sampling, y'all. Hang on a second. Okay. Well, it's, it's also, I'm just saying that there's the bag, there's like four or five different samplings, like a bag sampling, a, there's four or five of them, and I don't remember all the rest of them. Okay. So here you go. I'm just saying. So, so <clears throat> after cleanup, right, and phases, right, do we, we're going to have, we're going to do soil sampling. Is that what you're talking about, Shelly? We're going to do soil sampling. Uh, it really wasn't so much soil sampling. It was like... I, for some odd reason, what comes to mind is like um, a direct sampling or something, and 
additional sampling and there was there was like four or five different samplings okay i can tell you this i can tell you what the experience on the release y'all let me let me let me instead of reading it let me tell you what we sample okay we do badge samples let me show you what a badge sample looks like okay Y'all ever seen these when they put them on employees? Anybody ever seen those? No. No. Oh. Okay, that is a bad sample. What that is is that, Matt, Matt, you remember last night we were talking about a five gas meter or a VOC meter? So let me see. Hang on a second. Okay, so y'all are familiar with four gas meters, right? We're talking about yep. H2S, carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide, H2S, and LEL, right? And oxygen, right? Okay, on a VOC meter, y'all, we normally have a fifth gas, okay? But the fifth gas, the fifth gas will read VOC, okay? So look, will you kill, that one, no, that one's got hydrochloric, hang on a second. Let me do a, a, a multi-ray. Some of these, y'all, just to let you know, it even takes it to gamma rays now, okay? Okay. Okay, this one, this is traditional what you guys are reading right here, right? Oxygen, H2S, CO, and LEL. Do we agree? Yeah. Uh, these four. Yes. Okay, here, instead of CO2, Shelly, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll put a photoionization detector in. You reprogram the meter, and it's going to read for VOC, volatile organic compounds, Okay. So volatile organic compounds are the compounds like in toluene, xylene, benzene that are the most harmful to us, okay? So what happens is, is this, is that, let me let me take us to it. Matt, remember I was talking about most of these have a sensor, okay? So air meter sensor. Most of them have a sensor. Let me see how the, uh, let's see, oxygen. See these sensors right here? This is with your oxygen, with your LEL, with your carbon monoxide, and with your uh, CO meters. This is what they'll look like, Matt. Okay? This is ray systems, but they all look pretty much alike, okay? There'll be a little bit of difference in variation, but they're really close, all right? Now, let me show you what a PID looks like. These are all, like I said, so these, they're color-coded depending on the gas, okay? So now let me show you what the, um, now let me show you what, let's see, air meter sensor, PID. This is, Matt, you remember I was telling you about a PID, a photoionization detector? Okay. Sometimes they look like this. This is more frequently what they look like. Y'all see this one right here? You see that this is like a little glass eye. Okay. These are like little filters. This one's like a little glass eye right here, Leroy. That's called the PID, photoionization detector. Okay. I'm going to tell you where you see it, Leroy. I told these guys the other night on, on the other webinar. You normally find yeah. them in your smoke detector, except they're the yes. cheap, except that now in a VOC meter, they're extremely expensive, okay? What happens on a VOC meter, y'all, <laughs> is that when we pick up VOC, Matt, once they pick up VOC and we start to determine what that VOC is, we have to take an estimated guess at what it is, okay? In order, in order to determine what that VOC is, now what's going to happen is one of two things. We pretty much have to follow the lineage, Shelly of what gases we're, we're exposed to, to see if it was benzene heavy, H2S heavy, toluene, xylene, or whatever the case is, okay? Then they'll use these. Y'all seen these before, these big old single gas meters? Right here in this wand right here, is what happens is you have a color metric tube. Let me show you what it looks like.
Y'all seen these before in the workplace? Anybody? Um, yes, no. sir. Okay. So, so, so let me tell you what that is. These right here, these right here, they're called the color metric tube. All right, Matt. What happens is, is you put it on a pump like this. You put it on the pump and you compare it to a sheet of paper. Okay. On a comparison chart. Matt, they put it. They put it on a sheet, and you wind up doing like a comparison chart to see what the color. Like, oh man, I think this is it right here. To see what color, what color, what happened to your tube? Okay, you remember when you were in school, Matt, and um, like probably like lower elementary or junior high, and you did litmus test. Y'all remember what I'm talking about? Yeah, I'm sure I've got it. Okay, here you go, right here. Let's say perfect example, right? So let let's say right here. Depending what I'm reading for, it's going to give me a range, but it does not give me an exact number, Matt. Okay? Also, I can compare it to a chart, to a color, like a bit of a color chart, almost something like this, right? But this is all the same thing, but it would be different variations of that color. And the deeper the color, the more the concentration that it has. Okay? That, that is a qualitative test. Okay? Uh, that's qualitative because it's judging opinion and comparison. A quantitative test is doing a single gas meter. So let's see. So do, being a single gas VOC meter, that color metric tube goes out, goes in that syringe, and it's called the pump. And that's for a that's for a qualitative test, Matt. This is for a quantitative test. This is a single gas meter, and it's going to read one chemical depending on what we have it programmed in, and that color metric tube is going inside this spiral bound in this hose. Okay? So that so that color metric tube is used for qualitative testing, and it's used for quantitative testing. Okay? Now, I don't want – look, y'all, I don't want to get too far off on meters because I'm telling you, we, we can talk about meter – Brandon, can we not talk about meters all night? Okay, so yes, sir, we can all night long. Yeah, it's y'all. It's just it's too much information, right? So let's do this. Do we agree that these are most of your sensors, and the color code is for the gas that it's reading? Do we agree with that? Okay, and then yeah. your P, your PID. So Shelly, I'm not going to go any further than that because we'll never get out of it. Okay, here's your PID. That's yeah. what I'm talking about that's your PID. That reads your volatile organic compounds: benzene, toluene, xylene. And then once this picks it up in the meter, when the meter picks up a VOC, and then we have to go to what I just showed you, which was this color metric, this the single gas meter, <clears throat> or the color metric, or the color metric tube that I just showed you. Okay, so that's what happens with a single gas is that regardless, we're going to have to have a color a color metric tube involved in the. Um, we're going to have to have these color metric tubes. Involved whether we use this, which is a qualitative testing equipment, it gives us a range, and you compare it to the, like I said, to a comparison sheet, and it's it's written on there by parts per million or hundred parts per million or billion sometimes, all right. Or you put it into the right meter with the right setting with the right tube, and it'll tell you it'll give you a scientific calculation of what it is. So these are called pump techs or pumps, okay. All right, so let me go back to different types of sampling. Shelly. Okay, so let me let me tell you now, y'all, what we're sampling because I want to kind of move on from this, okay? So we may be doing badge sampling. We may be doing area swabbing, okay? We may be doing area swabbing with um, surface, let me see. Where we're swabbing areas, like we'll take something like this, right? They'll take a certain area, all right? As per the instructions of the manufacturer, we may swab a square inch, we may swab six square inches or a square foot. It depends on what the manufacturer tells us to swab, okay? Depending on what hazardous chemical we're looking for. So we have area swabbing, we have badge sampling, we have four gas, we have single gas color metric tube, right? For qualitative and quantitative testing. We have water sampling, we have soil sampling. 
All right, Shelly, did you read up on any more than those than the ones I just mentioned? No. I'm sorry? What did you ask me? I said, did you read up on any of more of the ones than, than other than the ones that I just asked, that I just mentioned? No, I'm, you know, there's just some, some like the grab testing and, and, and things like that. I do know that they mentioned that in there. Yeah, and, well, you know, what I'm talking about right now is grab testing. Now, another thing we can be doing is grabbing a sample from the, from the product. Like I said, soil sampling, grabbing from the liquid product itself. If once it hits the water, we'll do water sampling. All of those are grab samples, y'all. We're grabbing okay. real time. We're grabbing real time, but we're not assessing real time because it's not always that fast. Okay. If you know, sometimes we have to send it off to a lab. So what's the fastest way to have it? Is it electronic testing or qualitative testing? Okay. So when we talk about grab samples, Shelly, we're talking about all of those. Okay. Okay. Now, let me go to the last one, y'all. Let me go to 40 hours, okay? General site workers, okay? Laborers, right? Equipment operators, supervisor personnel that engage in hazardous substance removal. So you remember the BP oil spill? And let me show you who's doing the 40 hour, okay? These employees, so the employees, these employees right here that are cleaning boom, y'all, these are 40 hour employees. Okay, they're 40 hour employees. These employees right here cleaning tarmac. Okay, they're 40 hour employees. Uh, you know, so what's happened is the reason they're not in this CBA, y'all, is because we've already read the air enough, uh, Leroy, to where we've done our four gas and maybe even our five gas. And we've determined that maybe they don't need a respirator at all. Maybe the volatile organic compounds are that low, right? We've checked our LEL. We've checked our oxygen, our CO, and our uh, H2S. And maybe no significant hazard exists, okay? So it all, it all depends on – it all depends. Here's another perfect example right here. These were all 40-hour training employees on the site, y'all. Just because they're 40-hour employees doesn't mean they always have to be in Tyvek. And it doesn't mean they always have to be in SCBA. It depends on how bad it is. Okay. Hey, Doug. Yes. So, T. What is TSC? TSCA. TSCA. Yeah. Or, or Sarah. What is Sarah? Oh, Sarah. That's the Clean Air Act. Okay. So you're talking about you might be talking about Title Five. So you have. Title well, I, I, I've got a question here, and it it has Recra, OSHA, TSCA, and SARA. Okay. And it's it's saying T, TSCA is the right answer to what I'm reading. I thought it was Recra. Um, okay, that's probably Title Five. Remember, I was just saying Title Five. This is saying Title Six, but they had a Title Five too. Hang on a second. It's an act that authorizes regulation on the development, distribution, and marketing of a chemical substance. Okay. So that's probably going to be – TSCA is probably EPA. Let me see. I've never heard of it, Matt. No, I hadn't either. I'm, I'm, you know, most of these I know. But... Yeah, you see, look, it, what I just say, it's EPA. Anytime it's chemical, it's probably EPA. Okay. It's almost all I, – Matt, I'll be honest with you, man. I think at that point, man – I think that's time we could be better served than something else, man. All uh, right. Okay. So I would worry about RICRA. Now you know TSCA where it comes from, right? But but I think now you're going way, way far out on the environmental end. Okay. Nothing wrong with it, but I just think that time could be better served. Okay. Okay. Now, this is what I was talking about, y'all. So let, let, let's clarify some, right, Sarah? Uh, remember I was talking about Sarah's Title V? So we're talking about emissions. Remember, I was talking about. Remember, I was talking about Superfund earlier, right? That means that when they do certain releases, they have to pay into the. They have to pay into some of the all these different programs, Matt, and that's where the money comes for for these environmental cleanup projects. Okay. So, like that's what I was talking about earlier. Remember, I was talking about the Superfund sites. So, and it comes, and it all comes from the Clean Air Act, is what it comes from. Okay. And then, um, and then, so this is the thing. This is these are the biggest ones: EPA, RICRA. 
Resource Conservation Recovery Act. Okay, that's EPA. Okay. OSHA took EPA and they created Haswapper. They took RICRA, right? And they created Haswapper. All right. So this Haswapper is OSHA. Okay. And they it's modeled off of the EPA's RICRA Act right here. You see it? You see what I'm talking about? And then you have the DOT, Matt. Okay. Which is hazmat. Which here you go. Now the DOT, but I want to find the government. Let's see. So this is what I was talking about. You see USDOT hazmat? That also follows the EPA RICRA standard. Okay? So RICRA's EPA. The DOT adopted it, y'all, and created hazmat. Protect the drivers, protect the public. And the roadways, right? All, all, all modes of transportation. OSHA adopted ha uh, RICRA, and they created HAZWOPER. So HAZWOPER, RICRA, and HAZMAT, Matt, are ba all based on the same thing, all based off of RICRA. Okay. Okay. Look, let me tell y'all something. To the point to where we had a client, Leroy, that had to have eight-hour RICRA, eight-hour HAZMAT, eight-hour HAZWOPPER, Matt, we found in the standards where one, where HAZWOPPER covered RICRA and HAZWOPPER covered uh, uh, HAZMAT. Okay? So let's say HAZMAT training, right? That's how much weight... That's how much weight um, OSHA has, okay? So here, here's here's the training modules, right? And let me see if this is the one that says it. So it used to be HC-141, but I think they changed the numbers on it now. But what happens is right here, so HAZWOPER training requirements, right? They go in to talk about, has, uh, this is from OSHA. And they talk about different hazmat courses. Like I said, hazmat is the is the DOT. Okay, so they'll go in to talk about all the responsibilities for hazmat for hazwopper, and they'll talk about how you can credit you can piggyback them. So what I did, Matt, is for our client, what we did is we took hazmat, hazwopper, and RICRA. We taught the same eight hours, and they got credit for all three because because they say. Uh, Rick, let me see. Rick, uh, I think it's like 262 or something like that, I think. Rick, Rick training, uh, annual refresher. What is EPCRA? That's even in here. In the book that I'm studying. Uh, EPCRA? E I have no clue. Yeah, section 313 of EPCRA. Another, there you go. Uh, emergency planning and community right to know. So basically, okay. it's almost like the equivalent of our Haswapper. Uh, actually, actually, excuse me. It's the equivalent of our Hascom. Okay, we have a right to know and a right to understand on our Hascom. Okay, that's under EPA. Okay, that's what I'm telling you. Most okay. of that, most of the chemical um, standards that you find are going to be EPA. I think I think they're stretching now on what, what is that? Mometrics or one of the other ones? This is all span. It's got a ton of it in there, man. The thing is, Matt. I, I mean, I think we're going way too far out. I think I spent way too much time, I'll be honest with you, on Haswapper. I just don't see you having that much on there. Okay? okay. Let me go back. Okay, do we, can we agree with this, y'all? So right. what controls Toxic and Substance Control Act? I'm sorry? Who, who's the controller of Toxic Substance Control? I, I don't I don't understand the question. So, so – this T TSCA, they regulate the development and distribution okay. of toxic substances. Okay. So who controls it? I don't know if they're – well, I don't, I, don't, I don't know enough about it. I don't know if they okay. mean the Control Act is the government, or I don't know if they're talking about who's got possession of the chemical at the time. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're beating a dead horse in this book on that shit. So. That's, that's my point, man. I think it's going way too out of bounds. Uh -huh. Okay? I think that you can – man, if you stick to the stuff that we've been talking about – I think by this, you, you're, you know what we're doing? We're stretching for that one question that might be on there. Wow. 
Okay. So this is what I, this is what I'd like you to know, right? I'd like you to know that hazmat DOT, right? Hazmat's going to be DOT. It stands for hazardous materials. Okay. RICRA is EPA. Protects the environment, right? DOT protects the roadways, airways, right? Airlines, railway, and uh, pipeline. Okay. And then OSHA is Hazwapper. Those are all the same thing. They all come, they're all based from RICRA. They all do the same thing. They just protect a different part, a different area or a different person. But they're all based off the same standard. So the cradle to grave is very important, right? Whoever birthed it owns it until they can prove who sold, who bought it, or adopted it. All right. Now let me let me close this out, y'all. Let me close this out. Was let me go back to the training for Hazwapper, okay? Let me go back to the Hazwapper training so we can close this out. All right, general site workers, 40 hours, okay? Workers on site only occasionally that might have limited contact, 24 hours. Regular workers that might have limited contact, 24 hours. Workers with 24 hour training, right, that are covered in the section, they might become general, if they become general site workers, you have to add 16 hours, why? Because general site workers have to have 40 hours. You see what I did? Mm -hmm. Okay, site managers, 40 hours, okay? Now look at this, training might be reduced to 24 hours and one day of, one day of field, right? In the area where employees are covered, okay. So there's certain requirements that if they're if they have limited contact, we can reduce their hours if we don't expect them to be overly uh, uh, overly exposed to that environment, okay. So so look, if it's a first responder that all they do is report zero training, right? If it's somebody that's supposed to block it off and not let it get into the drains, eight hours. Anybody who's going to be close to it might get affected by it, but doesn't have a specific cleanup requirement, 24 hours. Anybody who's got to clean it up, 40 hours. Is that cool? Yes. Y'all want me to repeat those or we got them? One more time. Okay. Employees who recognize and all they do is report, no time limit training. Employees who rec who recognize the release and are required to start throwing out boom or covering like uh, like drain you know drain culverts and stuff like that eight hours of training because they're not touching the chemical all they're doing is just covering everything so they might come into incidental contact okay now employees who might have a minimal contact. Or, or, or um, with a cleaning environment, right, or disposal, 24 hours for supervisors and employees that might have some incidental contact because they're working around it, but they're not necessarily cleanup workers. And general site cleanup workers and supervisors, 40 hours. Okay. Now, the 24-hour and the 40-hour persons, y'all, they also have to have three days of field training by the employer. Like drills or actual work. Okay? So, Brandon, do you remember for the BP oil spill, people were saying, oh, they OSHA did an exception that they're doing a hazard for 40 in eight, uh, in eight hours? I remember that, and they got in trouble. Yep, they got in trouble. Well, this is why. Eight hours was only for people who were supposed to be blocking out drain lines, right, and putting out boom, okay? But what happened was they weren't giving them an eight-hour certificate. They were giving them a 40-hour certificate, and that's where the problem came in, okay? So what happened is somebody grabbed a piece of the standard in either one or two things. Either they intentionally or unintentionally manipulated the standard, okay, and they were wrong. All right, y'all, so can we agree with this? If we're going to be around, around hazardous chemicals, we have to be trained. Yes. Can we agree that the more hazardous and the more proximity that they have to it, 
the closer they have to get to 40 hours. Yes. Plus three days of field supervision. Okay. All right, and and then and then all, and then let me close it out, y'all, with proximity level suits. Okay, let let me let me close it out with um, with Hazwapper level suits. Okay. Right here, we talked about this last night, Leroy. Okay, so I'm not going to get into it too deep. Self-contained mm -hmm. breathing apparatus. A is the most protective factor we can have. Self-contained breathing apparatus, fully encapsulated suit, and then another suit underneath it. Okay. Chicken feet right. covers for the boots, glove, inner gloves, and outer gloves. Okay. Level B, still a self-contained breathing breathing apparatus. You see it right there in his back. Okay. Now just a Tyvek suit, top and bottom, taped the bottoms. Okay. Gloves, only one set of gloves now. All right. And SCBA and fully covered, but not encapsulated. Just fully covered with like chemical suit or Tyvek. Okay. Level C looks just like a level B, except now they can be in a half face or a full face respirator. And level D, just traditional PPP, PPE, daily PPE that we use. Y'all got it? Yes. Which one's, yeah. the, which one's the safest? A. Awesome. What kind of respirator do they have to have? SCBA. Awesome. What kind of suit SCBA. do they have to have? What does the suit have to do? Full uh, containment. Uh, absolutely. Encapsulated, right? That's it, y'all. What's the least What's the least hazardous level? D. There you go. That's all I need you to know. And do we agree that A and B both have to have SCBAs? I'm sorry, what was that? Do we agree that A and B both have to have SCBAs? Yes. And we agree that C is air purifying, right? Correct. That's it. That's is, all. Is air, is air purifying a continuous supply of air? Nope. Air purifying is strictly. So uh, let me go back to the respirator types, right? Isn't that one of the things you said you wanted to talk about tonight? Yeah, I mean, yeah, whatever everybody needs. Okay. Well, I can get us through that fast. So uh, let me see. Right here. All right. Okay. These are air purifying. Half dust mask, half face cartridge, full face cartridge, which is level B. Either one of these two. So it's not air supplied. It's, it's air purified. Okay. All the way down to a pump full face and a pump and a pump hood. But these two are not air supply. They're, air, they're P A P R. So these three are A P R. Air. These three are air purifying respirators. A P R. These two are P A P R. Powered air purifying respirators. So it's got a motor. It's got a pump mat, but it doesn't have a hose. It's taking fresh air and it's pushing a pump so that it takes less strenuous uh, strength on the employee to have to to have to breathe. Okay. Right. So all of these are air purifying. They only work with nuisance dust and very, very, very low concentrations of hazardous chemicals. Okay. These three are air supplied. SCBA, which is a tank on our back. These two air supplied line with a full face respirator, air supplied line with a full hood. Okay. So these two are a line that's supplying air. This one's a tank that's supplying air. These three are air purifying. These are the three that we go into an oxygen deficient atmosphere, and we also go into highly toxic atmospheres with these. And the safest of all of them is SCBA. Why? Because we carry the air ourselves. That's why with Hazwapper, we can't have an airline. It's got to be SCBA. Okay. You want me to show you another way to remember that SCBA is the highest strength? Do firemen go in with SCBA or do firemen go in with airline hoses? SCBA. There you go. Why? It gives the best safety protective factor. You're carrying your own air on your back. Right. Okay. With SCBA, y'all, with these two right here, Leroy, with these two, you have to have a emergency pack 
You do not have to have an emergency pack. It's a best practice, but it's not required with a uh, with a SCBA. Okay. Matt, do I need to elaborate on these a little bit more for you? No, you're fine. Okay. Hang on one second. Leroy, can you hear me? I think Leroy, Leroy might have fallen off, y'all. Hang on one second. Leroy, you there? I see him. There you go. We're okay. back on. Yeah, yeah, okay, good, yeah. I saw you, but I just couldn't hear you, man. So, okay. Did did you miss anything, Leroy? Um, you just started talking. Uh, we had to scroll down to the um, air supported ones. Okay. So uh, let, me, air let me go back up a little bit. Okay. These are all air purified. Do yep. we all agree? Yes. So these are mm -hmm. nuisance dust and very very mild doses of of uh, toxic chemicals. Okay. These three, Leroy are oxygen deficiency atmospheres and more toxic atmospheres, okay? Air supplied, you have to have an escape pack or a five minute pack with a full face. Air supplied with a hood, you have to have a, a five minute pack or emergency pack with it as well. Both of these have a hairline coming in, okay? SCBA, we're carrying the, the, the air on our back. Full face respirator, this is the safest that we can go right here. If we need to go to level D, we're going to wear all that with a with with a totally encapsulated suit, including all the way down to a hard hat. Okay. Yep. Does anybody have any questions about that? Does anybody have any comments they want to add? Shelly, Matt, Brandon. <laughs> 